This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found on Gadget Geeks show number 412, recorded on August 8th, 2019. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the Average Guy TV studios in a beautiful mic. We keep saying this, but if summer's over, I'm okay with it. Like, it's beautiful here, right? And I, I looked at the weather. It's not showing any signs of letting up, so pretty nice, right? It's been, and it's that constant temperature that we don't get often in Nebraska. Usually we're up and then we're down and you get, you know, you can't really plan for it, but you're right. It's just constant mid eighties, maybe a little higher than that. It, and just clear skies. It's been absolutely perfect. Sometimes the light rain just to cool things down a little bit, but it's been perfect. Unbelievable. Aaron, uh, you're a little farther North the weather. Okay. For you guys, we, it was really hot for a while, but okay for you guys. It was all right for a while. It's been kind of cruddy this week, but, uh, things are looking up today. I can't complain. Okay. Well, weather matters. We're going to spend some time talking to you tonight about this new van that you have and, of course, uh, going out and camping. So hold tight. That'll come a little bit later in the show. But uh, we'll remind everyone, uh, world-class show notes available, including complete transcripts now available in the show notes. Head out to theaverageguy.tv forward slash HGG412. We'll get you there, and you can get all the links, including the link. And it's going to be some required reading. So you want to head out to Erin's site, the link where she kind of documents everything she's done in the van, as well as a YouTube video that she uh, just produced today that you're going to want to take a look at. So make sure you head out to the show notes. They'll be in the upper part of that. And so you can get that done. Don't forget, you can also join us live on our mobile app, homegadgetgeeks.com. We'll get you there, Android, iPhone, totally free, best way to listen on the road or whenever you need it streaming. That's kind of the best way to do it. I know most of you have podcast player that you listen to it on or however you do that. But uh, if you're on the road or streaming, uh, try our mobile app, completely free, homegadgetgeeks.com. We want to thank our Patreon subscribers for helping us get that done. And then a little more chatter in our Discord group this week. I appreciate it. Mike started a ham channel after the big ham episode. Mike, I got a lot of good comments. Anybody contact you after yeah, the ham they show? Did. Yep. Uh, Chad contacted me and he said that he grabbed a radio and, and he was just getting ready to program it so i was excited i i said well let me know it's it's a kind of a steep learning curve for the first bit but then it gets really fun oh super cool um aaron any thoughts of we know there's not a ham radio in there now any thoughts of putting a ham radio in your in your van i would totally consider that <laughs> i i know absolutely nothing about ham radios and you gotta get a license get schooled and would need a license yeah um, but no, I'm, I'm open to all that stuff. I mean, all communication right. is huge and it'd be nice to be able to stay in touch. Mike, you've seen the, what the van looks like. Again, we'll talk about it more here in just a second. Be a nice little ham station, right? I mean, oh, perfect. lots Especially of places to put antennas. Unit. Yeah. Mobile unit, one magnet antenna right on the top. And they even have them with GPS so that when you're out of cell phone service range, you can send messages and people can track your, your trip. They can log into a website and track everything. So might be a cool addition, you know, something in the future to think about. You never know. You never know. We uh, last week we talked about besides ham radio. We talked about the the Govi Bluetooth thermometer and hygrometer that I'd gotten for the cigars. Uh, got a bunch more cigars in, by the way. We'll we'll talk about those in in episodes here in the future. But that hygrometer um, has really worked out well, Mike. I, I put the I attached it to. Let me go big screen on this uh, so folks can maybe this will help with it. So I attached it here to my uh, fire. I think this is a fire seven. I don't know if you can see the temps. Yeah, it's hard to see. Okay, it is. Well, it's 69 and 70, which is just perfect, right? You want cigars at 70 degrees and 70% humidity. And it's really cool because I just put this on my desk. I have put the little hack on this thing so the screen never goes off. If you didn't know you could do that on your, on your um, Android devices, there's a little developer hack that you can do that will keep them constantly on. And I've just set it up right on my desk here. And it's just a reminder of how beautiful it is when your cigars are both 70 degrees and 70% humidity. Um, it took me a while to get to get all figured out and balanced. That was a lot of fun. Much like your, your ham radio um, gig from last week, I was moving around Bovida packs and I've got some, uh, I've got some gel packs that you put, you know, you put distilled water in all these things. And it's just a challenge, right, to try and get the perfect temperature and the perfect humidity in there. And I think I've achieved it on both sides. And now both uh, both humidors are full. And I went out and bought a I just bought a plastic flat plastic tub 
for one of them. The wood one was not holding it. The Basically, the results of the hygrometer test from last week would not hold the humidity. The highest I could get it was maybe 63%. Okay. And that's just not going to work. So I went down to Walmart for $11. I bought a plastic tub that seals on both sides, threw those in there, set it up, locked it down. The $11 humidor, that's plastic and you can see through, works great. So you don't have to buy a big expensive... It's, Aaron, we're probably going to talk about with the van. You don't always have to buy the most expensive options, no, right? To get, to get some things done. And so uh, that hygrometer is working out um, really, really well. And kind of wish it was Wi-Fi in the sense that I could see it from work, but that's a bad obsession. So maybe yeah. it's maybe it's good. That it's just well, Bluetooth. I'm, I'm glad it works because the one thing I thought about after the show that I didn't really think of during the show is that, you know, you've got that in a very small place that's at 70% humidity. I didn't know if that humidity might affect it at all. Like, you know, kind of that high moisture content might uh, get in there. So it's great that it stays sealed and it's working for you. And yeah. and that, it, that the Bluetooth, you know, I think you're right. I think Bluetooth is probably what you want. And it's right behind you. So it's perfect for your setup right there. No, it works out well. It goes on the fire. So a great a great setup and uh, it's something I'd recommend. Links for all of that are in last week's show notes. So home, uh, theaverageguy.tv slash HGG411 if you want to do it. Well, we've talked to you already. Aaron Lawrence is back, and of course, Aaron is uh, one of our favorite guests on Home Gadget Geeks. Aaron, welcome back. Hello, guys. Thanks for having me back. Super good to have you. You teased us at the end of the last time we had you on. You were like, "Hey, I'm thinking about making this, you know, this van." The in in I call it an RV, but what would you call it? I call it a van, and it's legitimately a van. It's yeah. it's a large van but it's just a van. It's not an RV. It's not fancy. It doesn't have bump outs or bunks or anything like that. It is really just, we like to call it the stealth van because if, if I didn't have a, a box on top for gear, I mean, it would look like some carpet layers van or some tradesman's van. Well, it was right. You bought it. Yeah. It was, it was carpet. Was it, was that right? It's exactly. It's a yeah. carpet layers van. It's a 2007 Dodge Sprinter. Uh, and I've learned since that because there's Dodge Sprinter and Mercedes Sprinter. And I was like, oh, too bad we didn't get the Mercedes. But I guess Dodge actually took over selling the Mercedes Sprinter vans in North America and branded them as Dodge up oh. until I think it's 2008 when Mercedes kind of came back into the North American market and was like, oh, we'll take our branding back. Thanks very much. So our van has a Mercedes engine in it. It's built by Mercedes. It's all Mercedes except for the emblem on the front and the emblem on the steering wheel and the emblem on the back. But so when I go to get an oil change, I pay Mercedes prices. Oh, ouch. <laughs> yeah. We uh, will throw that up on the screen here. And it it, it kind of is, you know, it you're, you're right. It's stealth in nature. You wouldn't kind of know that it's a camper van or RV, whatever whatever you want to call that. It's built, fit, you know, fit fitted and built out on the inside. We'll talk some more about that coming up. Yes. Um, had you been camping before? I mean, what? why all of a sudden and why not just buy one? Great question. So why not buy one was that a newer already built out camper van can run, you know, for the same size, same type of van that we have, that Dodge Sprinter or the Mercedes Sprinter, they can run 80 grand and up. Oh, wow. And that's like Canadian or American, it's still a lot of money. So we looked at it and priced it out and realized that it was just out of reach for what we wanted to do. So what we did was we used an RV rental website um, kind of an RV sharing website. Um, there's a site called Outdoorsy, I think, that serves the U.S. Outdoorsy also serves Canada. And then there's another version called RVZ, R-V-E-Z-Y, I think, dot com. And it basically lets people whose RVs are sitting in their driveways, they're not using them, you know, they take their RV or their camper van or whatever out two or three times a year, and the rest of the time it sits around. It's, a, it's basically Airbnb for RVs. So we tried this site last summer and I had an opportunity to rent a camper van and we chose a camper van because I didn't want to have to worry about driving some massive rig and learning how to do cornering and, you know, changing the way I'm doing braking and everything like that. So we just wanted something kind of small and compact that was going to be comfortable. And we rented a Mercedes Sprinter and had it for the weekend. 
and just really fell in love with the experience. We were diehard tenters before, never had any interest in RVing, you know, always packed all our gear into a car or a small SUV, and we were perfectly happy with that. And then we took this camper van out for exactly one weekend. And then it was like, this is fantastic. We should do this. But because the pre-built RVs or camper vans were very expensive, we started thinking, okay, well, what can we do? And then I started researching van life, which for anyone out there who has had any curiosity will know, if you go search van life on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube, anywhere, it's crazy. Have either of you guys done this? No. No, oh is it God. like a whole community of people doing exactly what you're doing? Exactly. It's wow. it's a community. It's a movement. It's a phenomenon. And it ties into that whole, you know, tiny houses and small space ask. living and downsizing. Yeah. It's all under the same umbrella. So I think we kind of, for us, it wasn't the reason behind it, but it sort of tied into that. So, I mean, there's a wealth of information out there that if you're thinking about building your own van, there's so much out there in terms of resources and advice and information and videos and tutorials. So we started getting into this after we took this van out for the weekend and we're like, ah, this doesn't seem that difficult. My husband is extremely handy. I, I'm a good laborer and an excellent designer. He's like the engineering brains though, I have to admit. So we just started talking about what's it going to look like and what do we want to put in it? How would we design it? What features do we want it to have? And just sort of kept our eyes open for a van and ended up finding a used one on Kijiji. And, you know, within the space of like 24 hours had bought this van. Wow. Did you, did you find, um, did you have, like we mentioned this kind of a stealth van, did you have something else in mind? And when this came along, had to kind of change your mind a little bit or or was this what you were kind of what you were looking for my mind was totally influenced by instagram i've seen all these beautiful instagram photos where you know the back doors are open or you're you see the photos out through the windows in this van with the beautiful curtains and they're at the beach or the mountains and just all the lights pouring and flooding in so i really wanted a van with lots of windows and our van had zero windows except for the driver's windows, the cab windows. And I thought, okay, well, the first thing we should do is add some windows here because that'll really make it nice. And that was not meant to be in so many ways. We couldn't find aftermarket windows. When we did find aftermarket windows, getting them shipped to Canada was an absolute nightmare. Uh, most places wouldn't ship and, or they have distributors in Canada who of course mark up the windows to an exorbitant price. So priced us out of it. And then, you know, just when we found people who we thought, okay, well, if we can get some from a junkyard or whatever, can we get somebody to install them? It's kind of, I hate to say this, but it's kind of a flaky industry. And we just couldn't, we couldn't put the windows together with the installation that we needed and, and really be assured that we were going to have the structural integrity still of the van. So I probably spent like, almost two months off and on just looking and Kijiji and calling junkyards and reaching out to manufacturers and stuff. And it just, I finally just went, this is not meant to be, it's not going to happen and we'll just have to adapt. So we started adapting. After the build, um, and I'll show a picture of that here, and this may be a good one to come back to YouTube uh, for, to, to watch. Um, do you think if you put windows in now, I mean, would you want to after the build, because you, you kind of built it around no windows. Yeah. Would you you'd be fine without them now and just kind of be like, well, okay, maybe the next one? Or or would, if you came to the U.S., you'd said in your blog post, you know, maybe if you came to the U.S., you'd do it. Would you still do it? I don't think I'd put them in this van. Um, if I did, I would put one in the sliding door. But you're right. We built the interior of the van around not having windows. So there's a really nice, uh, it's technically a faux Spanish tile backsplash in the kitchen. Um, there's a sink cabinet, um, along the other wall and that sort of backs on to the large side sliding door. So if I was going to put in a window, I would put it on that side and it, in theory, it would be fairly easy to just put it in that door because we haven't really done any construction with that door. 
So I could do that. Um, I wouldn't want to ruin my my backsplash and the overhead built-in cabinet that we put in in the kitchen by trying to wedge a window in there. The other option we could do easily again if we were, you know, down in the States and and the stars aligned, we could put two windows in the very back doors, which again might be an option. So, but we've been out with it a bunch of times. And, you know, when you're parked, when you're camping, when you're at a campground or with some friends, you've got all the doors thrown open anyway. So you're getting the light, you're getting the breeze. It's just, you know, it would be nice to have a little more open area at nighttime because we usually will close the doors up and, and lock it up just for safety depending on where we are um but we put in a max fan to compensate for that so we've still got that airflow and the fan and and some of the breeze moving so talk a little bit about that max fan so it sits at the top of the vehicle right and then what kind of technology do you have for that as far as what can it do yeah so it's kind of we did some research into this and it's sort of the gold standard of the gold standard of ventilation for <laughs> camper vans and RVs. Hey, when it's important, you, you got to have it, right? They they came highly recommended, again, from the research that we did. That was the one everybody said worked the best, um, easy to install. And I mean, when you're cutting a hole in the roof of your vehicle, you know, with a metal saw, it's kind of intimidating. You want to have a good product. You want to get it right. You want to be sure you know what you're doing. So, um, so the van, or the... The fan basically has two settings. Um, you can have it so that it'll blow air out of the van. Uh, if you're cooking inside or sleeping inside, it's nice to have it sort of venting the air out of the van to prevent condensation. If it gets warm in there, kind of when you got the doors closed and you're sleeping, it's nice to have the air blowing in because it cools off the area and just keeps things circulating as well. So it'll do both of those things. It comes with a remote control and we haven't had good luck getting the remote control working. And initially we were thinking that it was broken. We're like, well, how do you pair it? What, how do you get it connected? So I called MaxFan and had to ask them, like, our remote's not working. What are we supposed to do with this? And I guess the infrared sensor that's built in to the fan, it's not uncommon, I guess, for it only to be able to be accessed from certain angles, which tends to, as we've now found out, be basically straight underneath it. So I can now make the remote work, but I have to be standing directly under the fan, which seems kind of counterintuitive to a remote control. But it does let me set the speed and the temperature, um, and it'll give you a little bit of feedback. There's sort of some digital information on the remote that's not on the controls on the fan. So... We're still learning our way through that. Maybe an IR blaster in your future that you could use from the bed, right? And yes. then just stick that IR blaster right up on that sensor. <laughs> it's a good idea, actually. A little amplification of signal might be helpful. So just get, you, it, get it down, right? You know, so yeah. you can see it, yeah. So Jim's showing the picture, and I think you talked about this a little bit in your blog post, but so you're showing that fan, and then obviously the walls we've talked about. How do you go about putting kind of the, the walls and the ceiling into a van because i'm thinking of like a house where you just screw into the studs i don't think there's studs if maybe there are and then you don't want to go like obviously punch out through the outside of the van on accident so how does that process all work so th that's a great question because i was mystified by this myself initially and these type of vans when you buy sort of these work vans or panel vans they have metal ribs on the inside so they're kind of like the structural two by fours in a house or in you know gotcha. a building but they're made of metal. They're sort of pre-drilled with holes. So we put um, basically wood along those metal ribs. And that, that gave us a surface to drill into and to work into. So we used, I think it was bolts. This is a little engineering question that my husband will have to, again, I was, I was screwing things in, but I'm not the engineer. But we put up these ribs and then that sort of gave us that surface to attach things to. So we attached the bed frame, um, anchored that in definitely with bolts. And then it also gave us a surface to screw the wood paneling in that we used to just do the side walls. That's really cool. And then everything, so you didn't have any mounting issues when it came to like weight on those. They hold up pretty well when you're, when you're going right to those kind of metal studs, we'll call them. They do. It's actually pretty durable. Um, we did have some concerns. And again, something we learned about is we opted to spray foam the van before we put the walls up. So we put up those 
wooden ribs and then we took it to a place that will basically just spray foam the whole inside and a lot of people on these van forums will tell you hey just get a bunch of cans of spray foam insulation you can do it yourself problem is if you do this wrong it will actually warp the outside of your van because of the heat generated by that foam expanding and filling all those cracks and stuff it actually warps the metal on the outside of the van. So you can search for this on Google and see all these people who basically bought, you know, two dozen cans of spray foam and try to do it themselves. And the outside of their van looks like popcorn. Uh, oh, wow. So having read that, I just thought, you know what, that's a <laughs> terrible idea. And by the time you buy all that spray foam anyway, I might as well pay someone, I think it was about five or 600 bucks to spray foam the whole inside. Yeah. And then I know it's done right. And if it's not, quite frankly, it's on them. So. But we found someone who does spray foam vehicles for a living, like that's their business here. So we had an expert do it and I would definitely do that again. That was a wise decision in my opinion. We, uh, we hear the two dogs that you have in the back. Oh, let, no. me, let, let me, you, no, you're fine. You're fine. But you built, one of the things is you acquired one of them, right? During this build. So kind of started with one doggy door, uh, as we see in the picture, you have, you have kind of two was that when you think about the design process, how much do you think you changed from the initial design once you started getting kind of into this and you're like, oh, that actually doesn't work or that's not practical or we need to change it. I know that kind of changed the configuration of your seating a little bit when you put that to that, that second doggy door in. How much consideration do you have to put into that in the engineering and the design? We thought we were kind of debating whether we should put in a kennel underneath the bed in the cabin area. And we thought, you know what, let's not, let's just put in storage and we'll kind of leave it. And then when we travel, we'll travel with the dog kennel. We did that once. We took one road trip with the dog kennel, just kind of in the cabin area, but you can't get around. Like we had to move. It's basically where you see that little stump stool in between the two cabinets, which is sort of the main walkway of the van. The dog kennel took up that entire space. So anytime we wanted to actually use the van, we had to take the kennel out, put it in the back, you know, live in the main area and then put the kennel back in when we had to move the dog. So in hindsight, we probably should have just put in a kennel in the first place. Then when we got the second dog, we realized we're definitely not traveling with two dog kennels. So let's do this right. So we had built in these beautiful built-ins underneath the bed and there was all these sort of little square cubbies for um, different baskets and different shelves and things like that. And you know, after we got the second dog, we realized that was a bad idea. So ripped all that out, ripped out basically the whole bed structure, which is sort of the back half of the van and rebuilt it essentially. So we built a large um, double doored dog kennel, which latches closed, fits both dogs. They've got plenty of room to sit, stand, lay down, move around, both of them. And it keeps them safe as well. So we've got a nice dog bed in there. There's some padding, really safe for them. And then it also gave us the opportunity to sort of reconfigure the seating area. So what we did is we put in a, basically a pullout table underneath the bed. So there's a little flip up door right underneath the bed. And there's a butcher block table that will just sort of pull out. And then there's seating on either side of the table. So one of them is sort of a built-in bench seat. The other is this wooden foam stool we have that actually looks like a, a slice of tree, basically, like a giant log. I thought that's what it was, actually, when I was looking at it. So yeah, that's foam? It's foam. It's basically 100% okay. foam. I found it on sale at a retailer in, in Canada called Simon's. Canadians will be familiar with it. But, you know, got it for like 40 bucks or something stupid like that and just thought, like, I should have bought three or four of them because it's your seat. It We've used it as a table, like between the two main captain's chairs. We've pulled them out and used them around the campsite and they weigh nothing. So if, if anything ever did happen in the van, if there was ever an accident or a sudden break, um, you know, those stools flying around aren't going to hurt anybody. Yeah, so yeah, com completely foam. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, and you can lift them with two fingers. They're so light. Yeah. In your post, you talked a little bit about the furniture. I'm a little more interested in the, the electricity setup that you have a little more on the tech. So Talk a little bit about, and this is kind of something you're continuing to add on to as well. So maybe talk about where you started with power, maybe some mm -hmm. of the 
why the outlets you put in and some you, you alluded to that a little bit earlier but talk a little bit about the power setup yeah. we knew we didn't want shore power we didn't want to have to rely on plugging in when we went camping we wanted sort of our own power so we installed um just basically a simple auxiliary battery and it's connected to the main battery in the van and when we drive about three hours at a stretch, that fully charges the auxiliary battery. That auxiliary battery can give us, depending on how much we're drawing, I'd say somewhere between like 16, maybe 12 to 16 hours of power. Mm. And that's us running the max fan, the fridge, which we also put in, we put in a large truck fridge, uh, the marine pump, which powers the sink and the water flow and the lights that we put in. We also put in some color changing LED light strips with of course, you know, a remote control where I can play around with the lights and they're assigned to different zones. So we can have different lights in different zones. We can have some on, some off, all remote controllable. So everything's powered by that battery. The thing we have started to realize is that, especially if we're charging our phones, charging laptops, which we're often doing when we're on the road, it's not quite enough power for us. So we're in the process of adding solar. So we've got a solar um, converter, I guess. I'm trying to think of, that's not the right word for it. Uh, solar controller. So we're going to put two solar panels on the roof and we got those from a company called Renogy. And again, doing the research that we did, Renogy was kind of one of the companies that came up as being the one you want, the one you want to work with. They've got really good quality stuff. So we got two panels that are just hopefully this weekend going to go up on the roof of the van. Those will then power the battery in addition to it being powered by the driving of the van, the running of the van. So we've kind of got redundancy in there in that if we're not driving, it'll get powered by the sun. If it's cloudy, we can drive the van and still have enough power. The other thing we might do is add a second battery. And that's probably going to be pretty realistic because when we go camping, we tend to sit and park for, you know, most of the weekend, two or three days. So it's nice to not have to you know, pack everything up, strap everything down. We got to go out and drive for two hours to power up the batteries. So that would be nice to have a little more reliable power. It looks like you've got a power, almost uh, a place to plug in a bunch of stuff, or maybe it switches. It's right on the side of the sink. What kind of unit is that? And what's that running? So there's a, our switch panel is on the side of the sink cabinet. And what's, there's a couple things in there. So those are the main shutoff switches, I guess, for all of the lights in there. Um, we've got a couple of extra switches on there for other things that we're hoping to add later. But the other thing we have plugged in there right now, um, there's a nine volt, basically a car charger, cigarette lighter adapter plug in there. And it's plugged into our um, cell phone booster. So this was the other thing that we wanted to add was because again, we tend to either have to or want to work when we're on the road or at least stay connected. And you know, when you're out in remote Canada, cell phone signals aren't the best. So I uh, did a bunch of research on cell phone boosting technology and there's all kinds of options out there. So I opted to try out a couple of devices from SureCall and they have two devices that I've tried out. One is the, I'm gonna get the name wrong here. So let me just double check it. Um, one of them is basically a built-in device. So the antenna gets attached to the roof. It's permanently attached. The power, you can either wire it into your battery or plug it in using that nine volt. And there's sort of a, I guess an interior antenna that lives inside the van and you can stick it somewhere permanently. And what that allows you to do is basically the closer you get to that interior antenna, it boosts your cell phone signal. So the last time we tried it out, we were in a remote area out in BC. I was getting maybe one bar of service if I was lucky. So we powered up this built-in booster antenna and ended up getting three or four bars as soon mm -hmm. as I got close to the antenna. So it really helps, especially, you know, if we're working, like we're hotspotting off our phones, we need that additional 
you know, upload and download power. So that was really handy. The, the built-in device is called the Fusion To Go 3. We also tried another device, which is called the N range, and it's a portable cell phone booster. So anybody could put this in their car. It's basically a magnetic antenna that just goes on the roof. There's another interior antenna that just sits on your dash. You can clip it to the vent and you just put your phone near it or attach the phone to it. It can also act as a little um, vent clip or vent mount. And again, it'll boost the cell phone signal for you. So I found that was really helpful, not just if I need to keep in touch with calls or texts, but when we're trying to work using our laptops or hotspotting as well. So how big is that antenna then, the one that you have currently installed, it's kind of more permanent? Yeah, the bigger one I would say is about, it's probably close to 12 inches tall. Not okay. that you, I'm, I'm making signs on the camera, but not that most people can see that. It's about, you, it's about you can, 12 inches. You can use centimeters too, if you want, that's okay. <laughs> no. No, no, no. Canadians don't actually use those. <laughs> oh, words. okay. Oh, oh, that's all. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, you got well, the inside scoop. Yeah, there you go. You've heard it here first. So, yeah, that one's a bit bigger. The portable end range version is more of like a shark fin, and I'd say it's probably only five or six inches tall. And you can, you know, magnet it to the top, take it on, take it off, whatever you need to do with it, move it around from vehicle to vehicle. It's um, it's pretty convenient. And how Both far... of those are, I'm sorry, hold on, Mike, yep. real quick. Both of those are in the video, by the way. So if you go out to the show notes, watch the video, you can see pictures of both of those. So I was looking for a few of those on your post and I couldn't find them. So Mike, sorry to interrupt there. Go ahead. No, I was going to so does it cover, does it provide pretty good coverage for pretty much inside the van? So anywhere you're sitting in the van or what's the range on the inside right. radio? So the more portable uh, booster, which is the called the N range is really just meant for one cell phone at a time. So you wanna okay. be using one phone kind of in contact with that antenna to get the best signal. Um, in my testing, you know, if you're if you're in, in front of it, basically, if you're sitting kind of back in your seat, you're still getting decent boosting out of it. The Fusion To Go 3, which is the larger, more built-in option, you can basically be anywhere inside the van and get a good signal. I Again, I found that the closer you are to the antenna, which makes sense, um, the better signal you get, but it's designed to boost multiple phones okay. inside a larger vehicle. And are they carrier specific? Like you have to get the right one for whichever carrier you have? Great question. Uh, carrier agnostic is what they oh, call that. Okay. So it will work with any carrier in Canada, the US and Mexico, I think it is. And just whatever you're using, it's just going to amplify that. And the other thing that I really wanted to be clear on when I was doing this this research is, you know, is is it going to get me a signal anywhere? And the answer is no. You you have to have some kind of signal to start with, and it will boost what's there. If you're in an area that is completely dead and not at all covered by you know cell towers, and you're not getting any signal at all, it's not going to create a signal where there was none. But if you've got a little bit of signal, it helps you boost it. So it does give you a bit more coverage in sort of those thinner coverage areas. Joe, Joe kind of alludes to that in the chat room. He says, as someone who lives in the sticks, I did a bunch of research on options for this area. And it's entirely subjective to what bands your provider are using and what your device supports. And, and like you said, um, Aaron, you can't make something out of nothing. So it, it does, it is going to require at least some kind of signal in the area, right? Exactly. Yep. Did you, um, uh, you'd mentioned the solar panels and are you going to permanently mount those to the roof? And, and I would have thought well, two things. One, I would have thought it may be easier in each setup to just pull them out, set them up, get them in the optimal spot to make sure they're getting sun. And two, even though, and maybe you can answer this question a little bit later. Did you retro it at all for plug-in? I mean, there may be some times when you go to a site and there's a plug-in and it's just easier to just plug in. So can, can you do that as well? So yeah. those two questions. I think if we were going to do a second van, which is becoming highly likely. <laughs> it's a bit addictive. I'm not well, gonna I was going to say, when you get in, apparently you go, you go deep, huh? Yeah. His, his okay. and hers. His and yeah. hers. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Driving side by side. 
Um, I would, I would probably put in shore power again, just for that reason that either, you know, if it's parked in the driveway, for example, and you just want to keep the batteries topped up and the fridge running because you might be using it every weekend, you don't have to take your food or your beer out, you know, that would be a good idea. And like you say, Jim, if you, if you roll up on some location and, and there happens to be a plug-in, why wouldn't you use it? So I would do that again. Um, to answer your question about uh, making the solar panels movable is something we looked at, but just I think for the applications we're going to be using it in and where we're going to be using it, and we almost just don't want to have to fuss with it and figure out how to store them because I understand that solar panels can be a little bit um, delicate, I guess. I'm not sure if the panels we got would be conducive to them kind of coming in, coming out, getting yeah. put up on a stand, moving in, moving out. Yeah. With that said, I mean, they're strapped to the roof of a moving vehicle, so they must be pretty durable. But yeah, we're going to permanently mount them onto the roof. We put in a roof rack uh, early in our reno with the intention that we would possibly put solar up one day. So in hindsight, great, great decision. We don't have to go back and retrofit that. So yeah, permanently installed. Um, we realize it's probably not going to be ideal for everything if we end up in a really shady campsite. You know, we might either have to repark or pull out into some sun over a period of time or just hope the battery carries us through. But um, it's a bit of an experiment and we're looking forward to seeing how it goes. This is kind of your the under the bed uh, storage slash um, uh, what do they call this in houses? The uh, crawl space. Well, no, there's a space. Uh, the, mm, it's a certain kind of room. I'll remember it here in a second. But. Um, all your electronics are kind of down here, right? Batteries are stored down here. Fuel would be stored here. Some of those other things you'd mentioned, um, also thinking about a generator. So have you kind of been toying with the idea of strapping one of those on the back or on the top or somewhere to be like, if worse comes to worse, just fire up the generator? Yeah. So we got, um, when we got the solar panels, we got a little gadget from, um, the same company from Renogy and it's called a Phoenix, not, well, the YouTubers will be able to see this, but it's basically a pop can sized power bank, I guess, that you can use to charge. Oops. Um, it's got an AC plug in it. It's got USB. I need better lighting in here. Um, so it can run, it can charge your laptop a couple times. It can charge your smartphones a bunch of times. So we thought that might be a good extra option to just have so that we don't necessarily have to be charging our smartphones and our laptops off the van. So this other thing from Renogy is basically an AC generator and it's a lot larger than the Phoenix. So it's more, my, from what it looks like online, I haven't seen it in person. It looks like it's more generator sized, if, if that makes sense to some of you, but it plugs in. So, I mean, you can plug it in, charge it up fully, and then it's got a ton more power. So we could run a kettle off it. We could run a coffee maker off it. We could, you know, use it for all kinds of other things. I could, I could run my TV lights off it if I wanted to bring, bring my YouTube studio out on the go. So that's something else we're looking at. And I'm really curious about how it works and how it could offset some of our power needs in the van. So it's, it's a bit of a work in progress because we think, you think you know what you're going to be using in the van and you sort of go, oh, well, I might charge my phone and you know, we might want to turn these lights on and then you forget that you might want to boil water using a kettle and that, you know, with certain kettles, you're drawing way too much wattage. So it's going to, you know, it's basically going to short out your system. So we're, we're learning a lot about the electrical process right now on this fan and we're, we are definitely doing some trial and error. Does anyone use gas for that kind of stuff on the inside as well? Like, does anyone, I mean, I, I imagine that would be dangerous, but does anyone run like a gas to do a kettle, things like that, where you could just screw on a little propane tank and, and you'd be fine? Yep. We actually looked at propane um, and much like the windows, it was such a difficult process and just, it seems like not a lot of people are set up for adding aftermarket propane. Um, we would have loved to have added a propane stove and a propane heater yeah. Um, you know, and that could have heated water and everything else, but we just couldn't find a reliable installer, at least in our city here in Canada, that could have done it. And then of course, you know, there's all the blogs and the YouTube channels that'll say, well, you can do it yourself. 
And I just thought, you know, blowtorch, yeah. propane tank, do it yourself. It's There's a reason I don't do my own breaks. There's a reason I don't do my own brakes. Yeah. You know, you just, it's, yeah. You, so you're there, smart. There are plenty of vans that have propane power and a lot of RVs too, to be quite frank. But, you know, those, those come with, generally speaking, or, or they've been added properly by the proper people. And yeah. it, it just wasn't something we could, we could line up for ourselves. Again, you know, in van number two, if I bought a van and it had propane, I would love it. That would be amazing. If we were in a different city where we could more reliably, you know, have it installed correctly, I would totally take a look at that because I think having a propane stove in there would be brilliant. Because what do you use now for, for any sort of cooking? We have a camp stove. So we camp will camp. do most of our cooking um, outside picnic table kind of stuff. We do have, because we put in um, an AC inverter, um, which is connected to the battery. So the AC inverter is essentially meant to allow you to run AC appliances and other things inside the van. It converts the battery power, the DC power to AC power. And I think I'm getting my electrical 101 right. Yep. <laughs> Thank <Sure>. you. <laughs> um, but what happened is when we started plugging stuff into it, so we basically connected an AC power bar to the inverter and then tried plugging stuff into it and it doesn't quite work so well yet so we plugged in a kettle when we were out with it uh the last time and the kettle basically would turn on and then immediately shut off and some kind of weird alarm would sound from the inverter and because because we bought the inverter online i'm pretty sure we got it off amazon it doesn't come with a manual there, yeah. <laughs> you you literally get the inverter and you're supposed to know what to do with it, which is, you know, there are great things you can get off Amazon from overseas, but a lot of them don't come with instructions. And the LED lights were that way. It just sort of showed up with all the LED light strips and they all needed to be hardwired in and soldered together. And there's no instructions. So you're you're kind of left to figure some of this stuff out on your own. Oh, Yeah. The, the, that's the fun of it though, right? That was probably half the fun. Did you guys have fun with the entire process of kind of going through all this, you know, testing something? Okay, that didn't work, like the dog kennel and things like that. Was it, was it an enjoyable process to kind of go through that? I think so. I really liked it. And the, the whole reason we bought an older van in the first place was so that if we screwed something up badly, we weren't ruining a $60,000 van, which is right. honestly how much a brand new... 2018 2019 sprinter van costs so i just thought if we're going to learn this process let's learn it on something that's a bit older that we can learn from our mistakes but still have you know a van that's you know that we're not going to completely ruin or at least be disappointed if we you know punch the side out doing something <laughs> I, I think you're finding the value it's like your first child right you make all your mistakes like on your first child and then the second line comes along and benefits from it all. And I think you're going to find, uh, you're going to find that as well. We have some questions from the chat room. I'm going to get to them in just a second. Uh, Aaron, I want to ask you about the, the in dash navigation slash or whatever you put in there. Talk a little bit about what you, I'm assuming this was aftermarket and aftermarket product as well. Definitely. So we, it came with a basic AM FM radio and we just thought, you know, for the type of road tripping we do, which is, you know, we usually cap it at about five hours of driving a day, a day if we're going on a road trip. But we thought, you know, we're in remote locations. We want a little bit more entertainment options. We put in a JVC um, head unit, which is actually tied to an aftermarket backup camera, JVC Kenwood backup camera that we also put in. So the camera feed will show up in this multimedia head unit screen, but it's also got, you know, ways. It's also got optional Sirius XM satellite radio, which we, I didn't realize that you need to purchase an antenna for that separately. So we bought the head unit and got it all installed. And it's like, where's, where's the satellite radio? It doesn't work. So added the antenna for that, which is great. So now we have satellite radio, but it's also got, you know, Apple CarPlay, which you can just connect your phone to the dash and it, it, it essentially mirrors the screen. So it makes it so much easier. So we've got radio, we've got multimedia, we can play our podcasts, we can listen to satellite, and you know it's got the backup camera feed, which is great. If I have a complaint about this unit, 
it's almost that it does too much. Hmm. And when you're trying to drive down the highway or frankly, even when you're parked, there are so many things this head unit can do that it's almost overwhelming. There's so many buttons, there's so many tabs, there's so many things and, you know, almost all of the options are available simultaneously that it can be, uh, it can be a little overwhelming. So, but the, this, this is my, my problem, my first world problem with my van <laughs> head unit. No, we, when we got my wife's 2016 Subaru Outback, it's got a big nav unit in it. Every time I'm in the car, I, okay, got to think through what are the steps? Okay. If I want to connect my phone source, okay. My phone, okay. Find my phone in the list. Do I connect it as a phone or do I connect it as a, a music device? Uh, in, in that, you know, there, your options vary. And so you connect it. Okay. I got to go back over, turn it back. I mean, it's great. All the things you can do. But it can become a little kind of overwhelming um, at times. Any any nav features in there? So are you getting any kind of, you said ways. So I'm assuming, is that coming off your phone? Is it getting the GPS that way? Or how is that working? I've been using all the nav off my phone just because I haven't had time to sort of go in and see how the other nav options work. It's my assumption that either we need like the cellular, the data, signal and the extras to make that stuff work. And I just thought 90% of the time when we're in Canada or the US, I can get all that stuff on my phone anyway. So why would I pay extra for nav on the van screen when I don't need it? And I can, I can mirror my phone to it anyway. So I, I haven't explored that option because it just feels a bit redundant. And that CarPlay has to be really nice, especially for like what you just said with a radio that maybe it's built in UI isn't the best. Then you have CarPlay or Android, whatever they call Android CarPlay, mm -hmm. and uh, just gives you a nice clean interface that you could still run Waze off or anything like that. Do you, does that have to run via a cord or does it go over Bluetooth when you're doing CarPlay? Our version is corded. So it's okay. got um, just like a USB cable out that we have a, a charging cable attached to. And I just find, again, when we're in the van, I think leave the stuff plugged in when you can, because there's going to be plenty of time for you to be off, off power. So I will use that most often just when it's plugged in and, you know, then you're not wasting the battery. We have a couple questions in the chat room. Joe asks, uh, maybe you can find a camper that scrap and part it out. Have you thought about kind of tearing out a camper that's got the that stuff in it, maybe consuming some of it in? 100%. And this is something else I've learned about Sprinter vans in particular, is that they are coveted. They're hard to get. They are hard to find used. And even at a junkyard, if you can find them, they've been stripped They because they're so hard to get. They're workhorse vans that people tend to hang on to for life. And yeah, it, it's just... I didn't mean to choose a van that was going to be so difficult to, you know, to work with or find parts for, but this, this is the van I ended up with. I'm, we might actually go with, um, I think it's a Ford Transit if we do van number two, or what's the other one? I think there's a Dodge version. And, you know, we love the Sprinter. It drives great. I mean, this one has like 250 or 300,000 kilometers on it. So... Mm -hmm. It's pretty durable. It's pretty long lasting, but yeah, they're hard. They're hard to find used. We kind of lucked into the one we ended up buying. I didn't realize it at the time. I do realize it now. They're, they're pretty coveted. So because of that though, do you find a lot of information online, like tutorials, how to help things? Like, are they coveted by people like you who are converting them into camping vans or are they coveted because they make great work vans as well? I'd say it's probably more the work van option. Okay. I think I think people will hang on to these vans for so long that, you know, like the, the carpet layer that we bought ours off of, he hung on to it for as long as he wanted to before he was ready to trade it up for something else. And like he listed it and it was sold, you know, in basically 24 hours. So it's tough. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Do, well, and I, and I think to Joe's question about parting out, it wasn't thinking about trying to find another transit to part out, but have you thought about finding a, a traditional camper RV, you know, one of those tow behinds? Oftentimes those have, um, you know, those have cabinets or cookware or things you can, you, you know, kind of cut out of there and install, scrap the thing and just keep the best parts out of it. Mm -hmm. did, that, did you guys think about that? Well, funny you mention it. 
I, because I've been surfing Kijiji secretly slash not secretly for van number two, I found a 1979 GMC. Um, I don't know what they're called. I think it's class C, but it's, it's one of the, the smallest RVs that you can get. That's still a drive, driving one, drive in one. The guy wants $1,500 for it. And it looks like it's in decent shape. And I'm like, oh my God, we could get this van. We could tidy it up. It must be, it must run. Like, and I'm just like, my husband is just like, you are crazy. Like you need to calm down. You gotta and be like, careful. No. HGTV is going to contact you. You're going to be like the new fixer up of her vans. <laughs> You're going to like start this new thing where you just go in and fix people's vans up. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's going to be the Aaron Lawrence style of, uh, of vans. That's yeah. great. Fix well, and I, I found I found another one in 1989. Um, again, more of a van van. Like, what did they call those? Like the Vanagon or the, like, it's a, it's a GMC van. And size, they... So like a conversion, like a, a traditional conversion van? Yeah, it's kind of like oh. the older, like 80s, mm -hmm. 90s, yep. like rounded size, GMC yep. vans. Yep. Yep. But I think it's got a bit of a pop roof on it. Anyway, same thing again. Like they've got it all tricked out with propane and stuff. So I'm like, hmm. And I think they only want 10 grand for it. So I'm like, again, I'm like, honey, honey, yeah. can we, can we? And he's like, no, stop. <laughs> and then he's like, well, how much do they want for it? And then he's like, no. Yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had an 86 Ford conversion van Ooh. that had a seat. It would, you know, the back would lay down into a yeah. bed and then had two captain's chairs and a, a table in the center. No, no cooking equipment in there, but it had a, it had a TV console. In the oh, top, nice. and and so with five kids, a conversion van like that was super helpful when we traveled. Right, we did we did it that. Uh, that's kind of the way uh, we did it, and we got it done. Um, Andrew had asked about um, is your camp stove propane, butane, or something else? What are you using on the camp stove? It is a pro actually, it's white gas. I guess is what it is. Um, so it's an older Coleman stove, and it's got a little tank that sort of just lives on the front of it and hooks into the stove mechanism. Um, we just fill it up with, we call it white gas up here. I'm not sure okay. what it's camp fuel, I think is what Maybe it's, I think it's it. butane. That's probably butane. I think so. If it's camping, if it's uh, the yeah. camping, is that the butane is what we put in lighters too, right? Mike? Yep. Is that, yep. is and it, butane, like here, at least when you're buying, you can buy portable, propane tanks or the butane almost look like spray paint cans at least yeah. here the portable ones yeah. you take off the top and slide it right into that coleman and screw it in i have small little ones that have just a little tiny tip on the end and you turn them upside down to fill up the lighters like if you're you know if you've got a, like a cigarette lighter those go in there um and do that andrew also asks aaron have you looked at the 12 volt kettles he says those used to be a thing Oh, I have not. We've been trying to find kettles um, that are under 200 watts because apparently that's the maximum that our inverter can handle at one time. And the, the kettle that we've been trying this out with is exactly 200 watts, which apparently is not going well. So I will check that out if, if such a thing exists and I would, I would totally get one of those. Yeah, I want to see a hot water storage tank. So I want to also not only <laughs> solar panels, but I want to see thermal panels up there as well that's heating your water and storing oh, it in great. a hot water tank you had a little room in the back we we were looking at the uh we were looking at the back of your van let me see if i can bring that back up again and find the picture i think when we um we got of room a, back there. oh there's totally room and we've got yeah. this um portable shower solution we opted not to put a bathroom in the van because again from the research that i did everybody said you always think you want a bathroom in there and then you get one in there and then nobody wants to clean it out. So it's mm -hmm. like, oh, the, yeah, there's a bathroom in there, but don't use it. And if you do use it, don't use number two. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. And so nobody ends up using their bathroom right. for that reason. Right. So, and I just thought that makes so much sense. Like, I don't want to have to deal with that and pumping out the tanks and, you know, the smell and stuff. And I just thought we're off and usually somewhere where there is a bathroom. So let's not bother with that. But we got this, um, it's basically a black rubber tank that's got a hose attachment to it almost like the sprayer hose in your kitchen sink mm -hmm. and you leave this you fill it with water leave it out in the sun and the sun heats up the black rubber and it heats the water inside i mean it's not hot but it's nice it's warm 
And then you just use the hose attachment to give yourself a shower. Oh, nice. So if we do need one, it fits easily in the back. It stores back there. It's a great solution. It also compacts down to like next to nothing. And so that's that's our portable yeah, that, shower solution. That'd be Low another tech. another nice roof mounted where the tube is flat or maybe it's just a series of black tubes where the water sitting up there all day, heating up. Then it's already, then it's gravity fed for you at that point. Yeah. So you just kind of plug into it and you know, if you need There's to There's actually a lot of people who do, it's basically a PVC pipe hack mm -hmm. that they will put on the top of the roof rack. And, you know, I don't know what the diameter of the PVC pipe would be, but larger. And then you attach like a, a hose or a tap attachment to it. And because it's a black PVC pipe sitting on the roof of your vehicle all day, it keeps it warm. And then when you're ready for a shower, you just turn it on and the water's hot or yeah. warm. Yeah. Yeah. We had, when we had a pool, we had, we'd gotten a, um, and it was a specially made kind of thermal, you know, um, uh, very flat and you would put it out in the sun and then it had little tiny tubes, right. And it would run through it, start at one end at whatever comes out of your hose temperature. And then by the time it made it to the other end, it'd be pretty hot and, um, pretty thin and, and light, um, pretty long. So a little longer than your van that, that may not be practical, but <laughs> there are those, there are those hacks. I think, uh, somebody had said, I think, uh, let me find it here. I think, um, uh, um Tony had said 5.6 million plus posts on Instagram for hashtag van life. So it is, do you, do you feel, do you get jealous as you look at some of those pictures and you're like, Oh, so great if it was that way are you pretty content with what you have i'm pretty happy with how this turned out especially for our first go um we opted to keep things really simple we opted for you know straight up white paneling white cabinets kept everything really simple and clean put a little splash in there with those faux spanish tiles and we did um vinyl just vinyl roll flooring in there again for durability and simplicity and I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. I don't think I would do, in terms of like style and looks, I wouldn't do too much differently next time. Because I think you can add that stuff in with, you know, your bedding and throw pillows and seat covers and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. So, but no, we're, we're pretty happy with it. And the response we've been getting, I put it up um, on Twitter and Instagram today and getting a lot of really flattering comments and compliments nice. and stuff about it. So as a first time van builder, I'm, I'm really pleased. And it's, you know, it's not just me that's like, I think I did a good job, but other people seem to be responding to it as well. So I'm pretty, pretty pumped about that. I texted my wife, the link to your article, right. As I was sitting here, as we started the show and she responded back and she's like, Whoa, like, I, like, you know, she's like super excited. So I'm like, Oh, when I go up there, I'm sure she's gonna be like, that is like one of the coolest things ever. Oh so. boy. Well, yeah. if, oh, boy. if I can do it, anyone can do it. Honestly, well, like, you have a handy you just need husband. The time. Hannah doesn't have that handy of a husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm decent. I'm getting better, but no, I'm not the engineer. That's for sure. Yeah. And it does take time. This is the other question everybody asks. And, and we thought, you know, oh, we'll have this done in a couple months. No problem. And it's been over a year. And that's mainly because, you know, we're working on it on the weekends, maybe in the evenings. And then, you know, you don't know what you're doing. So it's like you start out, it's like, oh yeah, we'll put the, we'll put the ribs in. It's like, oh, we have the wrong size bolts or we need these screws instead, or we need some other kind of tool that we don't have. Like just yeah. all the tools that we ended up having to buy for this build. And you don't know until you're kind of in it. So it's like order, order a riveting tool off Amazon and wait two days for it to get there. And then realize that it didn't come with the right size, you know, riveting bit so now we got to order an extra bit so it took yeah it's taken over a year and we're just we just basically need to put some of the trim pieces on and some of the finishing work on it but it's it's basically done but it was it's a long time a long time in the making super cool yeah no that that is really interesting you also when we think about um all the tech uh, one more thing on the lights you had mentioned we, we you alluded to this earlier but the color changing of the lights isn't necessarily just for mood, right? I mean, what else are you are you finding when you're out and you got doors open and you're out in the open? Is there some advantage to having the ability to change the light color? Yeah. So two things. One is that putting on, say, like a red or an orange light, it doesn't tend to draw the bugs as much. Whereas if you have bright white light, 
the bugs are flying into the van all the time. The other thing I find about color changing lights, and I think we might have talked about this before, is that if it's hot, we don't have air conditioning in this van. We don't have heating either. But when it's hot, I turn the lights blue or green or turquoise or something like that. And it does help me feel like the environment is cooler. I realize it's probably, you know, it's probably just me and it's probably just the feeling. It's not, it's not the real deal. But, you know, I find that at home when it's cold and wintry outside. If I turn all my smart lights, you know, orange or yellow or red or pink, that I feel warmer and cozier. So I find that that in the van really helps the interior climate feel a little more comfortable. I, I do appreciate the bug thing. That's I hate going like anywhere. You know, I was in the military and I spent a lot of time camping, so to speak. <laughs> Air quotes camping. Roughing it. Yeah. And and I just in and I just kind of learned to really hate that stuff. It's and so when I go camping, if I can do anything to avoid bugs, uh, I'm all for it. I just there's nothing worse than that. Have you found so you've been you've camped in it a couple times, you've gone out sleeping in it. It's the most important. Let's let's be honest. I mean, food, you can always go to McDonald's and order something or find it or <laughs> steal some from the neighbors. You can't fake sleep, right? Either it's working for you or it's not. And so how's the sleep test? Yeah. It's super comfortable. We put in a futon mattress. Um we there used to be a place here in Calgary where we are that had beautiful futon mattresses, very affordable price. So that's what we got. And they went out of business like months after we bought the uh, the mattress. We ended up buying a double. And again, because part of our plan was to have just a double-sized mattress, and then we were going to put a bit of a built-in along one of the walls kind of beside the bed. In doing all of our reconfigurations, we realized we're not going to put a built-in there. A, we don't need it. B, too much more work let's just not bother. So we thought, okay, well, let's upgrade to a queen size mattress. We'll have a little more room. Because of course there's two dogs as well that like to get up on the bed. Yeah. And so we went back to try and get this other futon mattress and found out these guys had closed down. So total sidebar, but the futon is supremely comfortable. The other option that we've sort of looked at for a mattress is, um, you know, one of those mattress, uh, online mattress retailers that will deliver it, you know, rolled up in a box right to your door. Yeah. So I tried, I tried one of those, must be almost two years ago now from a company called Lisa. L -E -S -A. Oh, the Lisa? Yeah. And you like that one. I, I really did actually. Okay. We still have it. It's still our main uh, mattress for in our master bed and very comfortable so far, really durable. So I would look at getting something like that again, if we do opt to put in a queen size now and, and make the bed a bit bigger. But it's, it's so comfortable to sleep in. And if we, you know, have the fan running and the door's a bit cracked, or even if we're just, you know, laying down, having an afternoon nap or something, you know, I've got lots of nice bedding and fluffy pillows and, you know, duvet cover and stuff. So I've really tried to make it a little bit homey. Yeah, we've tried two of those uh, companies. We have a Casper is one mm. brand and then Tuft & Needle is the other one. Uh, we love our Casper, but so, so we had the Casper first in the apartment. Then we, when we moved into this house, we got a king size bed with Tuft & Needle. Tuft & Needle doesn't have as much support. It doesn't work as oh. well for us, but I'd be interested. The Lisa, I've heard really good things about. Everyone I've heard who has a Lisa say they're they're pretty comfortable. But, uh, but yeah, so a futon mattress probably works well, a little more pliable for that area if you need to kind of lift it up or do anything probably not as rigid as one of those foam one is going to be. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. We didn't think of that when we put it in, but there have been times where we've had to kind of lift it up and move it around. And you're probably right that with something more like even a Lisa mattress, for example, or Casper. Yeah, trying to actually, yeah, trying to wedge it into the van, like even trying to get it in there and yeah, bend it interesting. And stuff. You got to kind of taco it, right? You got to kind of yeah. bring it and up. I don't, really don't well like to get taco. any smaller after you take them out of the packaging. Maybe yeah. actually just take the packaging in there and then open it in the van. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's probably how you have to. to do it. You'd have to. You'd cut never it, get it cut, out again, yep. maybe. But. Cut it open. Yeah. <laughs> Tony says, uh, Zinus, I think that's how you pronounce it. Memory Ooh. foam, single piece mattress, affordable and very comfortable on Amazon. Tony oh, knows his stuff. So know, that, Tony. that may be one you might want to give it a look. The, I, I think the, the fun part about this, Aaron, is that you get to kind of experiment. You're in the price point where, like you said, 
you're in the price point where you kind of get to experiment with things and it, any any big blowout is not that big of a deal right yeah. you're kind of like oh, okay well we can try this out do you have you found have you had any um well you just released we're, we're hot off the press right that blog post yes. just came out today, today in the video as well um but do you expect maybe to get a few vendors to to say oh hey uh this Canadian blogger lady is now doing, you know, camping van stuff. And with as hot as that is on Inst on, on uh, Instagram, you think you might pick up a few offers to, to try out equipment that way? I would love to do that. And if we were looking at van number two, I think that would be, it would be really fun. We would totally be open to that. Um, and we've just had so much fun doing it. Like, you know, we've we've sort of made choices around the economics of what we've been putting in, but it would be really nice to be able to put in, you know, amazing stuff that I wouldn't have considered otherwise in van number two because I've got a little a little more flexibility with the budget. We um, I think we paid about nine thousand dollars Canadian for the van, which is like two thousand dollars US, <laughs> <laughs> and. I guess we've put in just right around $10,000 into it. So we are still well, well, well under what it would have cost us to buy a brand new, like even a 2017 Sprinter van. We would have been into that for thirty-five dollars or $45,000 and then had to put in, you know, the money to do the build on top of yeah. that. So I feel really good about it. And the other thing we're starting to do is we've had people wanting to, you know, to rent the van from us. So nice. It's like, yeah. hey, why wouldn't you? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Is that uh, something you guys would do? Trust someone to take that van out? Yes, we did. We did that last week. Okay. We were like, ah. Uh, it's like your baby. You, it know, you, was. Put so much, you put so much time and effort into that thing. It That's was. not, especially because you guys built it on your own. You didn't just buy it, right? If you had just bought it, you might feel differently. But I mean, the blood, sweat, and the tears all went into it. You hit Watch. the nail on the head that I didn't, I couldn't even articulate. But that was it. As I saw it driving off, and I was just like, take care of our baby. And then I'm like, <laughs> oh, this is so irrational. It's just a, vehicle. it's your first it's child. Fan. It yeah. is your first child. Let's just, I mean, a significant amount of time in, construction and mm -hmm. you know I, you get into these projects and you always think well in a month or two i'll have this thing up and running and it's nine months a year we've been talking about this for a while yeah and i've i've i pinged you in the spring hey how's how's the van coming you know we'd like to we'd like to do a kind of a walkthrough with you and um it, I, they always yeah. take longer right they always take longer than you think and and more than you expect and so you do you put a lot of time into that and you're thinking and you probably even have some systems that are a little jankety, right? They don't quite work exactly like they're supposed to. And you rig them when you get there and you know, oh, if, when this goes out, you got to kind of dance over here and tap against the yeah. side of the wall and, you know, and then it comes on. And letting someone, especially when they're paying for it, letting someone rent that, you're kind of afraid they're going to get out there and like, oh, the, the lights went off and we can't get them back on yeah. type deal. Yeah. And that was, yeah, we, we spent a little time with them saying like, you know, here's, here's how you finesse this and this switch is connected to this. And then, you know, we're realizing that we should probably have stuff labeled yeah. in there and, you know, cause we're, it's one thing for us to know that it's switch two and four, not switch three and five to get the lights on or whatever. But did your renters have dogs? So is that advantageous for them or those that uh, wasted space? They did actually. And they yeah. were, um, they were pretty pumped about it because they said a lot of people, don't want dogs in, in RVs and camper vans. And we just thought, well, you know, if, if our dogs can, can go in here, yeah. why, yeah, why wouldn't why, we let someone it's else? Kind of built, so. It's kind of built for them. Right. Yeah. So Aaron, super cool. We've had you long enough, but thanks for jumping in here and sharing this. We, I have been excited. This has been one of those long stories that I've been watching you on YouTube and you haven't been talking a lot about it on your regular YouTube channel, but we've been going kind of back and forth. How are things going? Mike and I have been super pumped. And when I, when I mentioned that you contacted me and you're like, okay, it's time. I'm Mike ready. Was like, yes. <laughs> yes. So thanks for doing that. As we think about your future, the, some of the stuff besides the van that you're working on, that you're doing, you've done some pretty great gadget reviews as of late. You do the Echo Show 5. Mm -hmm. that I saw, right? And and I picked up one of those too. Super cool. So I watched oh, your yeah. I watched your review on that. But what are you hoping to do? What's the future look like for you just as, as folks? And, and you've got you, your YouTube channel has grown even since the last time 
we saw you. So why, what, what would people look forward to on YouTube if they followed you? I would say one of the big reviews I have coming probably in the next two weeks or so is one of Samsung's new 8K TVs. So in the last couple of years, we've heard a lot about 4K TV technology, which is four times better than HD and, you know, sharper resolution, much better quality. And, you know, we've had 4K TVs for basically two or three years. And now we're already, we've already doubled the technology and we're now at 8K. So Samsung's just put out um, their 8K TVs. Uh, a couple other companies, I want to say Sony's one of them, will be coming out if they don't already have one. So I was fortunate enough to be able to borrow one of the 8K TVs from Samsung, along with the sound system as well. So that is set up down in my media room. So I've been trying that out. And so far, it's pretty impressive. It's interesting, though, because we barely have 4k content yeah. and finding yeah. 8k content is even yeah. harder. So That's what all the reviewers say. exactly yeah. all the reviewers so, I hear like, it's a struggle to find 8k content, but yeah. it looks cool. Well, and so. you need, you know, much like you do with 4k, you need to have the 4k streaming device, the 4k content, the 4k TV, you know, everything has to be 4k for you to get the 4k image at the end of it. And with 8k, you know, if you can find 8K content, there's no 8K streamers. So you've got to kind of make sure you can get the right content through the pipe. And it's a bit of a challenge, but all, yeah. all that will hopefully be in the review in the next couple of weeks. And if I'm also hope... reviewing another 4K TV too, which is, my house is full of TVs, which is <laughs> kind of a, a weird thing. problem to have. Not but... a bad thing. Not a bad thing. If folks wanted to follow you on YouTube, how would they find you? They can find me at youtube.com slash Aaron Lawrence TV. And yeah. I would love it if they would subscribe because I am very close to hitting a milestone of 20,000 subscribers, which I'm pretty excited about. So come on over yeah. to the channel and subscribe. YouTube subscription has gotten so much better in being able to subscribe and get notified. And, and I, you know, I've got some folks, including you, that I follow. And it's nice to come in the evenings. I come home and check my subscription. Okay, who's posted a new video? And I have just enough subscribers that I have kind of something to watch every night or a yeah. couple videos to watch every night. So thanks for doing that. How do they follow you on Twitter? I am uh, at TVChick1313 is one of my handles. The one I use for more of my tech stuff is at AaronLYYC. And it's also at AaronLYYC on Instagram. And we'll track all those down and put them in the show notes, make them available to you um, as well. I think you were jonesing for 10,000 the last time you were on the show. And we, I think we, we didn't get you there that night, but I think within a, a day or two, you were, uh, you'd crossed. Is that, is that right? I think is you're that? right, actually. Cause I hit yeah. 10,000 last November. Yeah. I think we had you on last fall. I think it was last fall, yeah. yeah. And I was going to bring you on the spring, but we wanted to see the van, and you're like, "That's not, right, not ready wait. yet, not ready yet." So yeah, so I'm pretty, I'm pretty pumped. I'm gonna. It took me about three years to get ten thousand, and I'll hopefully be hitting twenty thousand about ten months later. So good. I'm pretty, pretty happy with the growth, and just, yeah. just really, I just feel really good that people are enjoying the stuff that I'm putting out there and they're finding it helpful. And, and that's the stuff that means the most to me when someone mm -hmm. writes a comment on one of the videos that says this actually helped me make my decision or, you know, I really like what you're doing and I'm impressed by the quality, whatever it's, it makes it worthwhile. Yeah, no, you do a really good job. I, I love watching your video and look forward to seeing them come out and, uh, and appreciate the, the kind of the work that you do. I want to ask you in advance, we're going to put together a Christmas gadget. We do it every year uh, around Christmas time. If I ask you to come back and we did a, all the gifts you need to buy uh, around, Ooh. we usually do it late, late November, just as Black Friday is coming up and some of those things. Would you join us for that? Oh, that count right? me in. Absolutely. Okay. All right. We'll get you, get you booked on the calendar and, uh, and love to hear those things. Aaron, a great having you on. We will let you drop, and then we will finish things. Always great to have you. Thanks again. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks again, you too. It's nice chatting with you. You bet. Likewise. Take care. Mike, you gonna you gonna you gonna buy one of these vans? Uh, you know what? I, I I was I've been if I'm looking over to the left a lot. I've been doing like sprinter vans, everything. Just been looking all into it. Probably not gonna buy one, but it's extremely interesting. And then also, you know, she mentioned hashtag van life on Instagram, oh boy. and uh, I went into there and started looking. And there is, she's right. I mean, there is an entire just. I think someone mentioned in the chat five point eight million 
um yeah, totally pose. Yeah. yeah it's just totally super is. cool what they're doing with this yeah. stuff yeah I, I could i can totally see you doing this like, well it's just i funny. was a little afraid when i saw this i was like oh this sounds it smells like a uyghur Project. It does. Well, because it totally coincides. It's just so funny that last week we literally went and got, we set it all up. We got a system now for the back of our car um, for all of our camping stuff. And now we have it where I take two bins down here. It's everything. It's good to go because we're, we're going to take the boys camping. So good. I don't know yeah. if you like it. If you like it, I was great. never a big camper. So oh, yeah, we, we are, we're big campers. We love yeah. it. We have, we just haven't been able to it for the last two years because of the boys ages. So definitely something we want to get back into. Yeah. So Aaron pipes and he's just so much fun as always and great questions. Thanks again for having me on Aaron. You are, uh, you are welcome. She's, she's a great guest. Uh, always great to have the ladies on here as well. We don't, I was telling her in the pre-show, we don't have enough women still doing kind of this stuff in tech. And so great to have her on. I always want to encourage that because we need to, we, we kind of need to see more of that, you know, two, two, well, you're, you're young, but two white guys, <laughs> we could, we could use some ladies on here. Definitely. And I could work on some diversity as well. I, I need to find some some guests uh, to, to make that happen as well. Um, Mike, uh, some cigars came in uh, this week um, as well. And we, we got kind of pimped the hygrometer in the show. But that whole the whole thing was to get ready for, you know, I had uh, 25 new cigars come in as well. Uh, mostly to make room. Yeah, I did. And, it, and I was super worried about that, the wood humidor not being able to keep up with the humidity. Right. And it wasn't. It just wasn't. Which is great. I'm going to hold on to it. Well, you can't see it here. We'll pop out this screen uh, over here. Um, it's become the storage box for lighters, uh, um, uh, matches, any plastic bags, carriers, any of that kind of stuff where humidity doesn't matter. In fact, you want your matches to be a little drier. <laughs> and uh, and so those are all going in there. And then I bought this plastic. Oh, let me grab this really quick. Hold on. It really is kind of one of those things where I just went to Walmart and picked up a, you know, I picked this up off the shelf and I was kind of like, eh, you know, you don't have to get an expensive humidor, but it's just a, you know, Oh, I just... lo those are, we use those uh, as for Tupperware. Yeah. We have a few sets of those and they work great. I can, I bet I didn't even think about that. Those would be perfect. Yeah, they got that seal around the top. Yep. Rubbermaid yep, rubber on the top. They latch nice. Two handles they... to seal. You can actually push the air out, so you put the lid on, and then when you latch it, it it closes up that and creates that airtight seal, guaranteed not to leak. So you're like, okay, if they're not leaking, they're right. probably really good. Maybe not perfect airtight. You can see the Boveda packs on the back. I put those on the bottom. You can actually see then, oops, on this side, you can actually see the hygrometer that I have, that Govi hygrometer in the corner, and um, and then the cigars are stacked around it. So couple of java lattes some just java regulars that are in there i picked up a few more dark tabics that are on the bottom rough riders are in there and i got a new one for us to try a little nub you know little four inch nubs um and they are the brand on those i know some of you who do this are like man you get too many flavored stuff and i'm like well i don't really care <laughs> uh olivia nub uh a nonce nuance nonce um, that's in there, a little four inch. So maybe a 45 minute cigar, or half an hour cigar instead of a, you know, a full hour and a half on some of these. So, and we got Ed's cigars to smoke. Yeah. So you and I need to get to get so some then, beer to drink. Do you only have one hydrometer or did you get two? I can't remember. Do you have I got one, one also in the, I got, this one. I got the, the, the white one is the right there. That's the one I just got. Okay. I had ordered and we talked about this show, a couple shows. I don't know. Through maybe a couple months back, I'd gotten a, another kind of right. hydrometer. That's and you in said the it didn't work too well, well, right? Um, I thought it didn't, but when I I moved some things around and I got it's I now got it at sixty nine, which is the, okay. Yeah, it's, it's what these Boveda packs are supposed to keep the perfect humidity in there. So if it's too wet, it brings it down. If it's not if it's not moist enough, it puts it puts it in the atmosphere. It's kind of supposed to equalize the humidity in there. Um, so yeah. And then in the acrylic box, here, let me grab that one really fast. Not great to have all that dead air, but maybe I'll cut it out in post-production in the acrylic box then, right? This is that one here. Yeah. Then, that's the one where I thought maybe you had the other one. Okay. Over that... the packs in the back. And then that's the hygrometer, right? You can see it right there. And so it, the, the, the display is there. 
I also had it flipped over in the sensor, you know, the area that's open for the sensor was at the bottom and kind of pushed into a hole. And I thought, okay, maybe it wasn't getting an accurate humidity reading. So I flipped it over, added two of the gel packs to it. And as I'm looking at it right now, it's 68% uh, percent humidity. So Perfect. it was like, yeah, no, super cool. This is like one of those things like burst where we got, I got the technology working. So now it's perfect. And I'm like, yeah, I keep messing with it. What do I do now? Yeah. <laughs> like uh, these actually, these actually kind of work. So, uh, uh, pretty cool. And I'm, they both are loaded at this point. So I'm kind of, I, I think I'm good for the next six months or so. And, uh, and it's been fun to kind of figure out how to get, how to get that all done. So I think you and I, I'm going to try and get all this stuff over to you this weekend and, yeah, uh, kind of drop a care box, a uh, care package, so to speak of all those things. And uh, pretty cool. You got your ham license this week? I did. Got the ham license. And it's been way more fun than I thought. You know, Jim, I was actually really worried that I was going to, I was doing all the setup, getting all the radios up and going, and then I was going to get my ham license. Like, oh, well, now all the setup's done. And I was worried not, about that too. I'm not really wanting to talk, but it's been a total blast. I uh, I sent you a picture actually uh, at the beginning of the show on Facebook of, <laughs> I already upgraded the internal setup down here at the desk. So now I have those two Baofeng UV5Rs. I've got those as mobile. Just take them out. You can take them real easy, not set up here at the desk. And then I took the mobile unit I had in my car, brought it inside. So now that's a base unit. And I got, yeah, so there it is. So the, the interesting part about this is all these radios run on DC power. So that's why you need this power inverter. Um, same thing that actually Aaron was talking about, to take that DC, uh, sorry, take our AC from the house and turn it actually into DC power. So this is... This is a 30 amp one though. So I went in big on this with the intent of I can always upgrade in the future. And this could actually run two or three radios of this size or a bigger one. Um, so that is now, the that's still plugged into the antenna. It's in my attic though. So that's actually right here to my right. Uh, and it works fantastic. This is actually 25 watts. So the hand the handheld that I was using was 5 watts. This is 25 watts. And then I got a, another new radio for the car, a mobile rig, and that one's 50 watts. And that one in the car is awesome. It's got a, uh, APRS, which is essentially GPRS, or sorry, GPRS, GPS in, built into the radio. Does all that sort of tracking. It's got some digital modes. So that's my first radio that has digital. So you can do digital and um, analog. And so playing around with all that kind of functionality has been a total blast. So yeah, I kind of went a little wild with it, but now I'm set. I've got my radios until I want to start getting into HF. I think we'll be set. But the first conversation I did post down on Discord. Uh, but if you're not out there, if you go to w 0 egr.com i posted a video of my first conversation the first time i ever got to transmit on the radio uh and it, it was actually a cool conversation i got a guy uh learned after the fact i actually looked him up on qrz he's actually blind so he's a blind user oh, nice. um who does a lot of this radio stuff so uh it was it was a lot of fun it's yeah. been, been a blast super cool there is uh, i mentioned at the beginning of the show we've got that ham channel now in the discord yep. group if uh if you want to get out there um and get that done as well. The website is in last week's show notes. So if you go to the average guy.tv slash HGG411, you can uh, you can see Mike if you want to head out there and follow him on his on his newly freshly pressed WordPress instance and blog. So <laughs> yeah, I, I'd and seen by the time I posted it on Saturday, you'd already made a bunch of updates and changes to it. So. Oh, had I? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yep. And, you know, it's one of those, uh, yeah, because the, the first theme didn't work out too well. But, and then if any of you guys are hams, uh, W0EGR is the vanity I applied for. It's not active yet. So if you're trying to find me, um, my current one is KE0WKP. So that's actually my what I was assigned. So KE0WKP, if you're looking me up on QRZ or anything like that. Give me that, uh, shoot that over to me somehow, maybe on Facebook or something. So yeah. I can put that in the... I can put that in the show notes. So a couple of reminders for folks. Don't forget, we've, uh, we appreciate our Patreon subscribers and it's the beginning of the month. And uh, always appreciate that uh, when you guys support the show and do that. That means I can do certain things uh, here when we need to upgrade equipment or do whatever we need to do to get something, you know, I spill wine into a, into a mixer or something like that. I always appreciate you guys uh, helping me out. So um, if you want to do that, uh, the average guy.tv slash Patreon gets you there. The average guy.tv slash discord gets you to the group. The average guy.tv slash Facebook gets you in our Facebook group. If you still want to do that, you can send me an email, Jim at the average guy.tv. I always love to hear from you. 
I should mention we've got a couple new posts out there. I mentioned two of them last week, but um, I'm having some really good luck with some interesting guest writers. You know, they always want to pay. They're like, uh, I'm like, I'm not interested in a paid post. Just write something interesting. And so I just posted a brand new uh, a brand new post out there and nine tips for astrophotography images. And oh, so, really? yeah, super cool. So nine tips plus a link. It's really important. This guy spent a bunch of time creating this really in-depth astrophotography post. And he was like, hey, would you replace one of your, you know, one of your links? I, I found this, you know, they do this sometimes. Would you replace this link? I saw this, it's outdated. We got a new one. I'm like, no. But if you wrote like 600 words of original content, and gave me something interesting and embedded that link in there, I would absolutely put it on the site. And so his, he, this is kind of a basic nine tips. And then there's a link in there to go kind of deep into uh, some of his and some of the stuff that he's done. I checked it out. Pretty great stuff. And so guest writer, I don't know, I don't know him very well, but they're willing to write for us. And there's some interesting content. I thought my graphic was pretty cool too. So head out to the average guy. .t. I'm making my own Canva graphics, Mike, which is super scary. Like, okay. Uh, but yeah. Canva makes it pretty easy, doesn't they it? Do. They do. Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty proud of it. Well, just, just, I need some, I need some affirmation for me right now. So go out to the average guy TV right now, Mike, can you do that? All right. Yes. Bring that up in a web browser. It's the very first post out there. The new the new theme really allows for nice graphics and for them to be laid out in a way that mix nicely with the podcast. So go out to the average guy TV. Oh, nice. look at that. Yeah. I like it. Uh, not, not, not too bad, right? Not too shabby. Not too bad. So we've had a couple of those. I mentioned, like I said, I mentioned them last week, but to how to manage kids screen time is out there in the five best home automation gadgets under a hundred dollars. And so um, again, guest writers, uh, if you want to write, for, for me, if you want to put something on the post, you got something to say, you don't want to start a whole WordPress instance like Mike did to get it done. If you do, by the way, just go to maplegrovepartners.com and, and get a site from Christian. He'll have you set up running in no time. Of course, he supports uh, the average guy.tv network with what he does. And, and Christian, we appreciate that. But if you don't want to do that, you just want to write something. Ron, maybe you could write something on 3D printer, send it over to me. And uh, we can talk about or whatever you're interested in. As long as that's kind of gadget related, we'd love to have that. Jim, send it over to me, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv, and we will get that posted as well. Super easy to do and super easy to get done. Don't forget, you can download the app, HomeGadgetGeeks.com. My daughter's going back to college next week. We've downgraded to the two, three HelloFresh meals for two people, and I got to start cooking again. So... Here we go. We'll see how this goes. A couple more weeks left, but Mike, I'm just telling you, man, it, God, we've had some great meals. So the other day, real quick, toasted couscous. Like I never would have thought to, oh. to take. So you take, get a pan hot, put some butter in it, tablespoon or teaspoon, tablespoon, tablespoon or two, let that melt, throw the couscous in, and then toast it for about three minutes. So just get it so the couscous is brown, then put the water in, then boil it for a minute, then let it simmer for six minutes it makes some amazing couscous. Like it's incredible. You can doctor it as well, but pretty great. Hmm. Yeah. You know, you, I, I think you've got Hannah and I on the verge of, of trying it just because, you know, we're kind of, you know, revamping the food stuff again, especially just for her and I, the boys are getting to an age where we've started just cooking, you know, different stuff for them, right. Doing the easy stuff for them that they, that they're going to like the chicken and stuff. And they're like, well, we can do different stuff for us. So I think we might give that a shot. I think it's a great way to introduce your kids to some real food too. I mean, mac and cheese and hot dogs can only go so far, right? Yeah, you know, right. you're kind of like, hey, you know, we had this with this um, last night. We had chicken. I made this kind of this uh, sauce with mustard and chicken broth and and a little bit of water, and we put some cornstarch in, it, just kind of thick it up a little bit, and then some chives, some cut chives, and salt and pepper, and a little bit of seasoning, and that one on top of the chicken. And then we had, um, oh, we had jasmine rice that we had put mm. lemon in. Oh, by the way, I speared by mistake. I over poured my beer a little bit into the jasmine rice. I'm just, oops. You put beer in jasmine rice? I did. Well, I spilled it. I was. I oh, was you're poor. actually saying it was an accident. I thought you it were was. saying you did it on purpose. Well, well, okay. Okay. Well, okay. Well, you know, okay. Yeah. Whatever. How, however, however it happened, it so ended up in there. I'm pouring overflow. I'm like, oh, just put it over the rice. Right. And so it's like, I wonder how that's going to taste. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> really? Yeah, it didn't okay. suck. It didn't okay. suck. Sarah was like, how was that? I'm like, it didn't suck. 
So um, that was um, that was a pretty good good little find. In fact, I think the next time I make jasmine, I'm going to make it in beer and let the beer, you know, like a summer shandy, like a lemon oh, summer shandy. Because yeah. we put lemon zest in it, you know, but at the end. So we cooked it and then put lemon zest in the end. I think if you cooked it with a lemon shandy, mm, I think that could be pretty tasty. So we're going to give that a try. The alcohol will burn off. So it's not yeah, like yeah. you're going to get drunk on the, on the wine. Or on the that uh, wouldn't the be a problem either, you know. <laughs> no, but I, it's just I don't know. I am just enjoying that kind of stuff more than I ever have. Like right. trying out these new recipes, learning things like toasted couscous. You know, when we do these kinds of things, and now when we're eating dinner, I'm asking like, "Hey, how did you make this?" You know, and the kids, if I didn't make it, if maybe Sammy made it with Sarah or whatever, and it's just kind of changed things a little bit. So mm-hmm. I think anybody could benefit, even if you got small kids. You eat the good stuff. You can still make mac and cheese for them, right? But yeah, it's an opportunity for you guys to to get some some good pointers. And you know, when we started HelloFresh um, a year and some change ago, they had like seven recipe options, and now there's like fourteen. So you really get a a pretty wide variety of options there. So I just got some brand new coupons from them that were literally send one of those you, over to me. Yeah, literally get you a whole week for free. So I'm gonna I'll, do it. I'm just gonna I'll order it tonight call. and tell her, don't worry about ordering. Go, don't go to the store this weekend. We'll try it this next week. Yeah. Because yeah, how yeah. fast, how far ahead do you need to put your order in? Oh well, if you order it uh, this weekend, it'll probably be middle of next week. Okay. When you get it, Good something like that. And you get the whole weeks at once, right? Yeah, you get a whole yeah. box. That's the yeah. way. That's the best part of this coupon. I think it's a seventy dollar credit, and that will get you a lot of food at okay. uh, HelloFresh. So you can give that a try. I had a buddy at work do it. They're just just a couple no kids and i'm like dude you gotta you definitely gotta try this thing out and uh he ordered it and so if you need i've got a couple coupons that i think i have three right now and they always give me new ones so if you want to get free let me know jim at the average guy tv in the show notes is a link to get 40 bucks off so you don't want to bother me with that or i i think i make 30 off that or whatever if you want to uh, do that as well you can link us in the show notes we are live every thursday except next thursday no show next week I am in Orlando at Podcast Movement, getting super smart around all things podcasting. If you're going to be in the Orlando area or you're in the Orlando area, I'm going to be Podcast Movement. I'd love to hear from you. And I need to put that out on some social uh, places so people know that. But um, if you want to connect, love to connect with you. I'll be at the, I forget, some hotel and uh, and love to connect with you as well. So, but most of the time we're live 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, at the average day. We'll be back in two weeks with that. We'll say goodnight, everybody.